Okay, some more criticisms of mean variance optimization. It's a single period model, right? We generally think of portfolio management as a repeated process occurring over a series of years. And as time goes by, the circumstances, the data, the assumptions, all the different parameters we're looking at can change. And so we're ignoring things like trading, rebalancing costs, taxes, all those other things I mentioned. And so that's certainly a criticism. It's not set it and forget it. We set a portfolio for that client uh, the first day that they walk into our office and we never change it, right? And so when we're thinking about clients that you know may face these different changes, in their, uh, um, in their optimization, well then that maybe gives reason that we want to have a more complex multi-period model. And so we can do this with a portfolio where we're just looking at asset only, or we can also look at uh, um, optimizations where we're optimizing both assets and liabilities. So for example, if we use Monte Carlo simulation, yeah, we're taking a multi-period perspective here, right? We're not just looking at basically the results in one period, we're basically going to repeat this process and figure out sort of where our ending values are over the end of that timeline. So for example, we did that with the uh, retirement portfolio example that we did a little bit earlier, right? So we said, okay, in the 95th percentile, you were up here, the fifth percentile, you were down here, what other values in between? And basically that's coming from that multi-period perspective of that Monte Carlo simulation. It's basically running an outcome for each period repeatedly and basically seeing where the timeline takes you. So if we're trying to look at a mean variance optimization and we're just looking at assets, okay? In this case, we're not basically explicitly taking account of the liabilities or the consumption needs in this case. So what we're going to do here is to say, we're going to run an optimization just on the assets. Well, that may actually not be sufficient for the type of client that we're talking about here. So for example, if there's a pension fund, a bank, an insurance company, well, modeling those liabilities is perhaps just as important as modeling the value of the assets. So instead of having an asset only optimization, well, you want to develop a liability relative asset allocation. For a pension fund, obviously, where is that surplus? Are we in surplus? Are we in deficit? And basically, what is the progression of that surplus and deficit over time? Well, we can only get a sense of that by modeling both the assets and the liabilities. So this is also called ALM, Asset Liability Management. You might want to write ALM be below that because you'll certainly see that term if you have not already. And then anything that talks about investment from a liability-driven perspective, that also falls into this category. So we can look at um, once we start modeling the liabilities, we can figure out what the surplus is and how to optimize it. We can figure out how much we need to hedge to prevent a deficit, how much can return seeking can we do if we have a surplus, and then we can also talk about an integrated asset liability approach. In other words, an optimization that takes care of both of these things. And so all of these you know, are sort of different takes, different ways to sort of adjust to the fact that we need to incorporate these liabilities in our optimization. So we're going to walk through these examples here. All right. So first, what we're going to do here is look at the characteristics of liabilities and then think about how we need to incorporate them in the model. OK, so um, if we think about uh, pension payments, OK, some of these are going to be fixed, right? However, some of them are contingent on the lifespan of our retirees and things like that. So some of these are easier to model than others. Legal versus quasi legal, right? So there's a question of, uh, you know, basically, are we committing uh, you know, a breach of law? by not paying a liability on time? Or are we breaching a regulation? Are we breaching a contract? Things like that. And so um, these are also things that you know, we can help use to try and incorporate in our, into our model. We can also talk about the duration and the convexity of liability. This is particularly important for banks because banks tend to have assets that have longer duration, namely the loans that they give, let's say mortgage loans for a more extreme example, while their deposits, their liabilities tend to be short duration, right? Checking accounts, savings accounts, certificates of deposit. So the duration and the convexity of liabilities, particularly relative to the assets, is an important measure. Liability size relative to the size of the sponsor. In other words, basically, what are the magnitudes, relatively speaking? that we're talking about here to give us a sense of the importance. Drivers affecting the liabilities, inflation, the economy, interest rates, risk premiums, we can incorporate all of that macroeconomic data uh, and figure out how that, in, uh, how that affects the liabilities, put that into our model. Also things, timing issues such as longevity risk. So again, this uh, plays a role with pension planning, it plays a role with um, life insurance planning. So again, characteristics of liabilities that we can try to incorporate in our models. And then finally, any regulations that might affect our calculations in terms of somewhat, for example, required discount rates. 
that we need to use in order of calculating, let's say, the present value of liabilities, if that's imposed upon us, um, a pension fund or an insurance company um, by some sort of regulation, well, then that's going to be certainly something that affects the liabilities and how we model the assets corresponding with them. So generally, liabilities that we would call essential needs, they're going to require a lower discount rate, and as a result, they're going to have a higher present value. Okay, so let's do an illustration here, some liability relative asset allocation. So we have a pension plan that has assets of $550 million. Regulations formerly allowed discounting liabilities at the high quality corporate bond rate, okay? That's a higher rate than a risk-free rate. And so if we have a higher discount rate, well, then that's gonna make the present value lower. It made the present value of liabilities 475 million. But now let's say that regulation has changed. And now the discounting of those liabilities now has to be done at the long-term government bond rate. Okay, that's going to be a lower rate because it doesn't have default risk. So because the discount rate's lower, that means the present value now suddenly is higher. The present value of those liabilities, now $585 million. So demonstrate that the plan is underfunded. Well, that definition means basically is the present value of our assets greater than or less than the present value of our liabilities. And so if I have assets worth five fifty, dollars and now we calculate the present value of the liabilities as being 585, well, then we are in a deficit or we have a negative surplus, we wanna think of it that way. We can also calculate the funding ratio, present value of assets divided by present value of liabilities. If it's less than one, then we are underfunded as it is there. Okay, now let's say we wanna optimize the surplus. We're running a pension fund, an insurance fund, we feel that we have a surplus here and so we wanna optimize it. Well, how we can do that is we can use our mean variance optimization mass. So we're gonna use our inputs here, estimated liability return, which we'll use as our discount rate, the correlation of liabilities to the asset classes, and then any other additional constraints that we feel we need to put in there. And so what we're gonna do here is we're gonna have an efficient frontier of the expected surplus. The expected surplus is the present value of assets minus the present value of liability. So first thing let's note is that this graph's gonna look a little bit different than our standard efficient frontier graph, right? Because if I look down at the x-axis, sure enough, that x-axis is still standard deviation. But again, look at what the y-axis is. It's the surplus. So this is not gonna be expected return or any level of return in percentage terms. It's going to be a dollar amount, okay? so. Make sure you know that, that this is a dollar amount in the y-axis rather than a percentage return, because otherwise the graph's not gonna make a whole lot of sense. But what we're looking to do here is we're trying to optimize the surplus by figuring out, okay, at what level of standard deviation are we comfortable allocating the assets of that surplus into the different asset classes in order to figure out how much extra surplus we expect to gain from that, okay? So the current portfolio you can see here is that dot representing the current portfolio. And so the question is, do we, or can we demonstrate that the current portfolio is not optimal? Well, you've done enough of these, you know exactly what the answer to that is, is that no, it's not sitting on that curve. It's not sitting on the efficient frontier. So of course that means it's not on the surplus efficient frontier, which means it is currently not optimal. Okay. Now, again, if we have the surplus that we're trying to manage, or even if we have a deficit, you know, if we're taking a long-term approach, we want to turn a deficit into a surplus, or we want to maintain the surplus that we have, what we can do is we can do a two-portfolio approach, okay? So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to set up a hedge portfolio. So think of this as mimicking the liabilities that we have, okay? So in the most extreme case, and, and the simplest example is that I map out all of my liabilities period by period, and I invest in assets, let's say zero coupon treasury securities that will mature exactly on those dates in exactly those at, uh, the value in dollars or in whatever currency of what our liability is. Okay, and so what that means is that I'm doing, a, uh, I'm doing a strategy called cash flow matching. But let's say I match up every asset with a liability in exactly those amounts on exactly those dates, that would be a perfectly hedged portfolio, okay? So what that means is I'm taking the money that I have and allocating it exactly that way so that basically I have the same risk factors across the board. I should cover each one of those liabilities exactly with the assets that I have allocated to them. So that would be the hedge portfolio, okay? Now, if I have a surplus, if I have money above and beyond that, then what I can do with that portion of it is do a separate optimization, which will be a return seeking portfolio. So because this is money I have above and beyond what I need to cover my liabilities, well now I can play around with this. I got the keys to the car, so to speak, right? I can run an optimization here, choose some weights that are a little bit more aggressive with an eye towards increasing 
the value of that surplus by generating some excess return. And so that's what I'm going to do here. Now, complications, like I mentioned, what if we're in a deficit? Okay, well, then not only are we not going to have a return-seeking portfolio at that moment, we're not going to have enough assets to build a hedge portfolio, at least not for each liability in the forecastable future. So second thing is, what if we can't find a true hedging portfolio? Okay, well, in my example, we would use zero coupon treasuries to cash flow match every single liability with a corresponding asset at the same dollar values at all points in time, okay? Well, that can be kind of expensive, um, maybe difficult to do, maybe difficult to find um, zero coupon treasuries at every single date that we need them. So, you know, we may have some difficulty actually constructing this perfectly hedged portfolio. And so we can do our best approximation of it, but we understand that if we're not perfectly hedged, well, then there's still some downside risk, which means our return-seeking portfolio at some point in the future, well, we may need some of those dollars to actually cover some of our liabilities because our hedge wasn't as perfect as we thought. Now, some variations on hedging versus return-seeking or a combination of the two. So if we are conservative, we want to fully fund the hedge, right? So like that cash flow matching example I drew up for you, that's exactly what we're doing. We are trying to basically take out any potential downside risk here. And so what that means is that we're going to fully hedge and fully fund this hedge portfolio. And so that means if there's any return seeking that's out there, it's going to be limited only to the surplus. Now, if I want to take a more aggressive approach, I say, okay, you know what, maybe I'll hedge out my near-term liabilities, but I'm not going to hedge all of my liabilities. I'll sort of underfund the hedge. Basically, I'll cover my near-term, and then I'll figure out the rest later, kind of underfund it for now. And so what that does is that it gives me more money to put in the surplus portfolio, surplus section of the portfolio, that I can do some more return-seeking. And so what that means is that, well, I run a little bit more risk of um, you know, not covering my downside. What I can do is to say that, all right, if I'm going to underfund it for now, then assuming I generate the returns that I'm anticipating on the, um, the return-seeking side, the surplus side of the portfolio, well, then what I can do is I can throw off some of those cash flows so that I go from a glide path of being underfunded in the hedge to being fully funded in the hedge. So basically, as time goes by, I've already hedged these short-run liabilities. As these medium and longer-run liabilities start to come around, I either fund the hedge from an outside cash source or I throw off some of the cash flows from the return-seeking portfolio and what we call a glide path. Basically, little by little, I begin to fully fund that hedge section of the portfolio. Okay. Next thing, integrated asset liability approach. Okay, so we mentioned banks, insurance companies, pension funds, also long short funds. Those are all key clients that want to model both their asset values and their liability values. So here we want to simultaneously determine these so that we can deal with both at the same time. And so this is typically going to need to be a multi-period model, right? Because we want to look at how the assets and liabilities evolve over time and also get a sense of the evolution of what our expected return is and therefore what surplus we expect to get. Right? So this may be actually required by law. Some form of a stress test may actually require this type of analysis to figure out that, okay, if your liability portfolio looks like this, your asset portfolio looks like this, look at the various evolutions, different possibilities, Monte Carlo simulation, however you want to measure this, to get a sense of, okay, if things go significantly worse than you expect, are you still going to be, co- be able to cover your liabilities. So what we can do with a bank, for example, they can lend at 6%. Let's say that's their asset return. Let's call those mortgages. They can issue deposits or borrow at 3.5%, 5.5% respectively. Those are their liability costs. Okay. Now, like I said earlier, a bank's assets, particularly if we're talking about mortgages, they tend to be longer in duration. However, liabilities tend to be short in duration. So if we have a big spike in interest rates, That's bad news for a bank because they're still locked in to those assets, those mortgages, at the rate they lent them out at, but now maybe deposit rates have gone above that. So now they have a situation where they're paying out more in deposits than they're bringing in loans. Sort of thing like this happened in the late 70s, early 80s, put a lot of banks under a lot of strain. So we're looking at that volatility, that duration, and the correlation of those factors to try and get a sense of, okay, if we stress test this bank, if rates spike up, or if, uh, let's say, they have more non-performing loans than they expect, so those asset cash flows are less than expected, are they going to be able to meet their liabilities at every point in time? 
Okay, to summarize this, comparing the liability relative approaches. Okay, so if we do surplus optimization, Basically, we're saying, okay, yeah, we've got this surplus. We're going to run mean variance optimization to try and maximize the bang for our buck. How much extra surplus dollars can we generate for every unit of risk in that portfolio that we're going to uh, be generating? And so we can model that in standard mean variance optimization. And so we can look at a low risk application, a high risk application, just depends upon basically the uh, risk tolerance of our client to get a sense of, okay, how aggressive do we want to be with this portfolio and try and capture extra dollars to increase that surplus. Now, if we're using mean variance optimization, well then, yeah, we're going to be sort of doing this in a single period model. Now, we could certainly repeat this period by period, but it's going to be a little bit hard just from a standard mean variance standpoint to get a long-term picture. Maybe we could sort of build that out by doing various Monte Carlo simulations. But again, that's a main criticism of mean variance optimization is that it's a one-period optimization. Now, what if we look at a hedging slash return seeking portfolio? So here we're looking at uh, basically uh, saying, okay, part of the portfolio is going to be for hedging, part of the portfolio is going to be for return seeking. And so as a result, we can have some different assumptions and different relationships um, across these two portfolios. And so they, they can either be linear relationships, they can be nonlinear relationships. The focus here is that we want to be low risk. If we've underfunded the hedge portfolio, we want to make sure that we at least put ourselves on a glide path to becoming fully hedge. So if we hedge the short run liabilities, but leave the medium and long run liabilities a little bit uncovered, well, then we need to make sure that we have a plan to make sure we're covering those liabilities as we go. Now, this is also a single period model because, you know, we're also going to be looking at or we're also going to be using mean variance optimization here to some degree. And so, again, we need to repeat this process over time. But again, one by one, it's going to be a single period model. Last thing, if we do an integrated asset liability approach, a little bit more complex, we're determining both assets and liabilities at the same time. Again, we can assume both linear and nonlinear relationships between these two groups. Typically, we can use this in a method that perhaps, again, if we have a surplus in particular, that allows us to have a more aggressive portfolio by sort of um, determining both of these at the same time. And this sort of analysis is going to be a multi-period type of analysis.